what is life? So you said there's some order, and yet there's complexity. So it's not perfectly ordered. It's not boring. Mm -hmm. There's still some fun in it. And it also feels like the processes have a direction through the selection mechanism. They seem to be building something, always better, always improving. I mean, maybe it's- I mean, a, that's a perception. That's our romanticization of things are always better. <laughs> things are getting better, we'd like to believe that. I mean, you think about the world from the point of view of bacteria, and bacteria are the first things to emerge yep. from whatever environment they came from. And they dominated the planet very, very quickly. And they haven't really changed. Four billion years later, they look exactly the same. So for about four billion years ago, bacteria started to to really yeah. run the show. Yeah. And then nothing happened for a while. Nothing happened for two billion years. Yeah. Then after two billion years, we see another single event, origin, if you like, of, of our own type of cell, the eukaryotic cell. So cells with a nucleus and lots of stuff going on inside. Another singular origin, it only happen once in the history of life on Earth. Maybe it happened multiple times and there's no evidence, everything just disappeared, but we have to at least take it seriously that there's something that stops bacteria from becoming more complex because they didn't. You know, that's a fact that they, they emerged four billion years ago and something happened two billion years ago, but the bacteria themselves didn't change. They remain bacterial. So there is no trajectory necessary trajectory towards great complexity in human beings at the end of it. It's very easy to imagine that without photosynthesis arising or without eukaryotes arising, that a planet could be full of bacteria and nothing else. Okay, we'll get to that because that's a brilliant invention. And there's a few brilliant inventions along the way. But what is life? If you were to show up on Earth, but to take that time machine, and you said, asking yourself the question, is this a stepping stone towards life? Mm. As you step along, when you see the early bacteria, how would you know it's life? Is And then yeah. this is a really important question when you go to other planets and look for life. Like what, uh, what is the framework of telling the difference between a rock and a bacteria? I mean, the question's kind of both impossible to answer and trivial at the same time. And I don't like to answer it because I don't think there is an answer. I think we're trying to Those describe the, most fun questions. the process. What do you mean there's no time. answer? Oh, no, so, there is no answer. I mean, there's, there's lots of, there are at least 40 or 50 different definitions yeah. of life out there. And most of them are, well, not convincing. Obvious, obviously bad in one way or another. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, there's, there's for ex I, I can never remember the exact words that people use, but there's a NASA uh, working definition of life, mm -hmm. uh, which more or less says a, a, a system which is capable of, uh, of, of a self sustaining system capable of evolution or something along those lines. And I immediately have a problem with the word self-sustaining because it's sustained by the environment. And you know, I, I know what they're getting at. I know what they're trying to say, but but I, I pick a hole in that. And there's, you know, there's always wags who say, but you know, by that definition, a rabbit is not alive. Only a pair of rabbits would be alive because a single rabbit is incapable of copying itself. There's all kinds of pedantic, silly, but also important objections to any hypothesis. The, the real question is what what is, you know, we can argue all day, or people do argue all day about, is, is a virus alive or not? And it depends on the content. I mean, but most biologists could not agree about, about that. So then what about a jumping gene, a retro element or something like that? It's even simpler than a virus, but it's capable of converting its environment into a copy of itself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's about as close, this is not a definition, but this is a kind of a description of life, is that it's it's able to parasitize the environment, and that goes for plants as well as animals and bacteria and viruses, um, to make a, a, a relatively exact copy of themselves, informationally exact copy of themselves. By the way, it doesn't really have to be a copy of itself, right? It just has to be, you have to create something that's interesting. Like, uh, we, like the, the way evolution is, so it is extremely powerful process of evolution, which is basically make a copy of yourself and sometimes mess up yes, a little bit. Absolutely. Okay, that seems to work really well. I wonder if it's possible to- Mess up big time. Mess up big time as a standard, as the default. Uh, it's called a hopeful monster and uh, you know- there's, It there's, doesn't there's, work. There's, in principle, it can. Actually, it turns out, I, I would say that this is due a re-emergence. There's some amazing work 
from Michael Levin. I don't know if you came across him, but uh, you, if you haven't interviewed him, you should interview him. Yeah, for, uh, yeah, in uh, Boston. About, yeah. I'm yeah. Uh, uh, talking to him in a few days. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so I mentioned off, uh, yeah. is, there's two so people he's... that, Andre, if I may mention, uh, Andre Kapathy is a friend who's really admired in the AI community, said you absolutely must talk to to Michael and to Nick. This is so, so this, of course, I'm a huge fan of yours, so I'm really fortunate that we can actually make this happen. Anyway, you were saying. Well, Michael Levin is doing amazing work, uh, basically about the way in which electrical fields control development. Um, and he's done some work with planarian worms, so flatworms, where he'll tell you all about this, so I won't say any more than the minimum, but basically you can cut their head off and they'll redevelop a different, a, a new head. But the head that they develop depends if you knock out just one, um, one, 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 one iron pump in a membrane so you change the electrical circuitry just a little bit, you can come up with a completely different head. It can be a head which is similar to those that diverged 150 million years ago, or it can be a head which no one's ever seen before, a different kind of, of head. Um, now, that is really, you might say, a hopeful monster. This is a, a kind of leap into a different direction. The only question for natural selection is, does it work? Is the change itself feasible as a single change? And the answer is yes, it's just a small change to a single gene. And the second thing is, it gives rise to a completely different morphology. Does it work? And if it works, that can easily be a, a, you know, a, a shift. It, but for it to be a speciation, for it to to continue for it to, to to give rise to a different morphology over time, then it has to be perpetuated. So that shift, that change in the in in, in that one gene, has to work well enough that it is selected and, and, and it goes on and copied enough times to where yeah, you can really yeah. test it. And so the likelihood it would, it would be lost, but but there will be some occasions where it, it survives. And yes, the, the idea that we can have sudden, fairly abrupt changes in evolution, I think is time for a rebirth. What about this idea that kind of trying to mathematize a definition of life and saying how many steps, the shortest amount of steps it takes to build the thing, almost like an engineering view of it. Uh, ah, I that like that view um, because I, I think that in a sense that's not very far away from what, it, what 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 a hypothesis needs to do to be a testable hypothesis for the origin of life. You need to spell out here's here's each step uh, and here's the experiment to do for each step. The idea that we can do it in the lab. Some people say, "Oh, we'll have you know we'll have created life within five years," but you know, ask them what they mean by life. Um, we have a planet four billion years ago with these vent systems across the entire surface of the planet, and we, we have millions of years if we wanted. I have a feeling that we're not talking about millions of years. I have a feeling we're talking about you know, maybe millions of nanoseconds or picoseconds. We're talking about chemistry, which is happening quickly. Um, but we still need to constrain those steps, but we've got a, you know, a planet uh, doing similar chemistry. You asked about a trajectory. The trajectory is the planetary trajectory. The planet has properties. It's basically it's got a lot of iron at the center of it. It's got a lot of electrons at the center of it. It's more oxidized on the outside, partly because of the sun and partly because the heat of volcanoes puts out oxidized gases. So uh, the planet is a battery. It's a giant battery. Um, and we have a, a flow of electrons going from inside to outside in these hydrothermal vents. And that's the same topology that a cell has. A cell is basically just a, a, a micro version of the planet. Um, and it's uh, there is a trajectory in all of that. And, and there's an inevitability that certain types of chemical reaction are going to be favored over others. And there's an inevitability in, in what happens in water, the chemistry that happens in water. Some some will be immiscible with water and will form membranes and will form insoluble structures. And, you know, waters are, nobody really understands water very well. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's another big question for, for experiments on the origin of life. What do you put it in? <laughs> mm -hmm. What kind of structure do we want to induce in this water? Because the last thing it's likely to be is just kind of bulk, bulk water. Uh, how fundamental is water to life, would you say? I would say pretty fundamental. Um, I wouldn't like to say it's impossible for life to start any other way, uh, but water is everywhere. Water's extremely good at what it does, and, and carbon <laughs> carbon works in water especially well. So those things, and carbon is everywhere. So those things together make me think probabilistically, if we found a thousand life forms, 995 of them would be carbon-based and living in water. 
Now the reverse question, if you found a puddle of water elsewhere and some carbon, no, just a puddle of water. <laughs> Is a puddle of water a pretty damn good indication that life has it either exists here or has once existed here. No. So it doesn't work the other way. I think you need a living planet. You need a planet which is Condition. capable of turning over its surface. It needs to be a planet with water. It needs to be capable of, of, uh, of bringing those electrons from inside to the outside. It needs to turn over its surface. It needs to make that water work and turn it into hydrogen. So I think you need a living planet. Well, once you've got the living planet, I think the rest of it uh, is kind of thermodynamics all the way. So if you were to run Earth over a million times up to this point, maybe beyond to the end, let's run it to the end. Uh, what is it, uh, how much variety is there? You kind of spoke to this trajectory that the environment dictates like chemically, I don't know in which other way, um, spiritually, <laughs> like dictates kind of the direction of this giant machine that seems uh, chaotic, but it does seem to have order in the steps it's taking. Uh, how much, how often will life, how, how often will bacteria emerge? How often will something like humans emerge? How much variety do you think there would be? I think at the level of bacteria, not much variety. I think we would get, this is, how many times do you say you want to run it? A million, a million. times. Um, I would say at least a few hundred thousand will get bacteria again. Oh, wow. Um, nice. Because I, I think there's some level of inevitability that a wet, rocky planet will give rise through through the same processes mm -hmm. to something very close. I, I think, I, I, this is not something I'd have thought a few years ago, but uh, working with a, a PhD student of mine, Stuart Harrison, he's been thinking about the genetic code, and we've just been publishing on on, on that. Um, there are patterns that you can discern in the code, or he has discerned in the code, that if you if you think about them in terms of, we start with CO2 and hydrogen, and that these are the first steps of biochemistry, you come up with a code which is very similar to the code that we see. So it wouldn't surprise me any longer if we found life on Mars and it had a genetic code that was not very different to the genetic code that we have here, oh, without wow. it just being transferred across. That's There's really some inevitability about the whole of the beginnings of life, in my view. That's really promising because if the basic chemistry is tightly linked to the genetic code, that means we can interact with other life if it exists. Out uh, there. Well, that's potentially. The that's case that's case. really exciting if that's if that's the case. Okay, but then bacteria. We, we, we've got then we've got bacteria. Yeah. Um, how easy is photosynthesis? Much harder, I would say. 